you've got to come forth with some questions for Mr. Law. And so that's what I'm going to just let him, what am I talking about? Star Press, the newspaper business. The newspaper business, the Star Press, the future of newspapers, why, why the students should uh, sign up for the Muncie Star Press, read it every morning like I do, get up at 6 o'clock and run downstairs. Um, well, that, that carrier is still doing a nice job. Good. Uh, that can't be a good carrier. <laughs> no, we're talking about newspaper carrier, not like a disease carrier. You know, we're talking about that sort of thing. I'm going, to, I'm going to shut up and let him take it over. Okay. John says he was a carrier in an earlier <laughs> life. It could have been both. I don't know. Uh, the newspaper business has, has evolved dramatically in the last 50 years, in large part because uh, society's changed. Uh, today, for example, November 5th, the, the Atlanta Journal is going out of business to put no, no longer around. Even though the Atlanta Journal sells or did sell up until today about 87,000 papers a day in the Atlanta area. So why would a newspaper that sells 87,000 87, subscribers or, or, or people who buy the paper, why would this paper be folded? Uh, well, in a metropolitan area like Atlanta, the Constitution, the morning newspaper, uh, is much larger, uh, 300,000 subscriptions, uh, buyers each day. And uh, so the, uh, the problem with afternoon newspapers uh, continues to uh, take a toll on those that are published in the afternoon. Now, the two reasons that they gave for closing the Atlanta Journal uh, were, one, the declining uh, number of, of sales each day. That uh, Just a couple of years ago, they, they had 125,000 or so. Today, they have 80,000. And the second reason they gave uh, was uh, the fact that it's so difficult to distribute an afternoon newspaper. And you can imagine uh, trying to get that newspaper out that uh, probably comes off the press sometimes around noon in the middle of Atlanta and trying to just fight your way through the traffic congestion to get that paper distributed. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult thing to do. but. It's the first reason, really, that uh, uh, newspapers are really suffering, especially those afternoon newspapers. Indiana has, uh, these days, just one city with two daily newspapers in it. Anybody know what city that is? Anybody here from Fort Wayne? There you go. I mean, that's it. In the last few years, uh, Evansville closed its afternoon newspaper, Muncie, in 1996. Indianapolis just two years ago closed Indianapolis News, uh, where at one time most communities had two daily newspapers. Today, uh, they're a real rarity. Atlanta is the latest to bite the dust. Now just one newspaper, a morning newspaper. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the newspaper. The Indianapolis News is a good newspaper. The Atlanta Journal is a good newspaper. Uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of the content of the newspaper that they can't stay in business. It has everything to do with society. It has everything to do with reader preferences. It has everything to do with the way uh, things have changed, especially over the last 50 years. Primarily, competition in news and information delivery. Now, while newspapers don't compete just with newspapers anymore, newspapers compete with every other form of news and information delivery. And that includes direct mail people who want to grab our advertisers, our insert advertisers, and say, we can deliver cheaper than the newspaper can. Because the newspaper has to pay reporters and has to have big buildings. And has, but if you get a direct mailer like Advo, we can take those inserts and just mail <coughs> them out. And we can hit every household in the community because we have every address. The newspaper just reaches those people who buy their newspaper. But we can mail it to every address. So the competitors for news and information delivery include those people who undercut our revenue base, which is advertising, including insert advertising. But a lot of it, the demise of avenue newspapers uh, has more to do with the competition with direct media, the competition with the internet, the competition with television, the competition with weekly and community newspapers. So that is a, a pretty powerful force. In fact. Uh, newspapers are, are 
finding new and different competition all the time. Somebody else sees it, hey, this paper's make pretty good money. How can I grab a piece of that? And direct mailers are a perfect example. They're not in the newspaper business, but they are in the we can deliver your inserts business. And that's how newspapers make their money, and people say, I can make that money. And so we have that competition. But it has a lot to do, uh, the demise of newspapers, with uh, the fact that people don't read as much anymore. They watch television, they do other things. Or they have such busy lives that they can't, uh, they can't make the time. Sociologists call it high in poverty. Although the day, believe it or not, is still 24 hours long. People are trying to do more in the same amount of time. Uh, part of it has to do with urban sprawl and the fact that people now have a sometimes a half hour or maybe an hour or more commute to work and back. And so that takes time out of uh, their day that they might have spent reading newspapers. Since the 50s, late 50s and 60s, uh, women have gone into the workforce have left home, they're not staying home baking cookies and having dinner on the table for dad when he comes home and take care of the kids. Women have increasingly joined the workforce as well. And so you don't have those women readers there at work as well, uh, spending their time commuting, spending their time at work, and they don't have the time to read the paper or they don't take the time to read the paper as they once did. Uh, there are changes in uh, uh, the workforce itself. An afternoon newspaper, for example, used to get a product. Uh, of blue collar America, but it was a, a, a newspaper for farmers and factory workers. But large corporate farming and mechanization <clears throat> have uh, really reduced the number of farms that are out there. You have fewer farmers uh, uh, since, uh, especially since the, we've received uh, the competition we have in the uh, uh, many areas: steel making, auto making, and here in the Midwest especially. Uh, from the Japanese that when the imports started coming in in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, the American auto industry has had, has had to become much more efficient, which means reducing the workforce, uh, re uh, using more robots and other computers and mechanization to do the job. <clears throat> so there are fewer farmers, fewer factory workers, and as industrial America has changed, as production has changed, uh, that newspaper that served Blue Collar America has suffered. So you have all of these social changes, sometimes called secular changes, very basic, profound, long-term changes <coughs> as society evolves that has really eliminated uh, the afternoon newspaper as a viable information medium. You still have a few of them, but they won't be around for very long. Uh, Fort Wayne has a contract called the Joint Operating Agreement federal government has to okay to allow a legal monopoly to take place as it is in Fort Wayne. Uh, but uh, it's only a matter of time before the afternoon newspaper cannot uh, profitably publish in Fort Wayne. Uh, I would imagine the next five years will be a one newspaper town as well. So all of these changes take place uh, and newspapers have found themselves uh, hurting frankly. So what do newspapers do? Well, newspapers are starting to evolve. Uh, into something other than an ink on paper product. That's what we think of when we think of a newspaper. We think about something like this. That's a newspaper. The newspapers are having to become much, much more, in large part because they are forced by the competition to do what they do best, and that is deliver local news and information. We don't try anymore to give you a lot of national and international news in a newspaper. You get, according to surveys, you get as much as you want, and that's not very much. You get as much as you want from television or from other sources. Newspapers tend to be uh, local products anymore. You pick up the Star Press any given day, and most of the front page will be given to local news. Uh, there's a local section devoted to local news, and local obituaries, who got arrested, who got married, who got divorced, and who died, and, and uh, what did the government do, and what, what happened in the community. They tend to be local, largely local products. And that's a big reason that students don't connect with newspapers very much, uh, because you don't have much of a connection to Muncie. You don't have much of a connection to this community. You're here for four years, maybe, and you're going to be gone. 
And so you really don't care much what the county commissioners and city council are doing. You really don't care much about Muncie, frankly, other than the university that then happens to be here. And so because newspapers are largely local vehicles for local news and information, you're not plugged into the community and you're not plugged into the newspaper. Uh, newspapers are trying uh, these days to reach out to more and different and more diverse audiences, uh, trying to attract younger readers. Uh, the thought is that, and I've seen conflicting data recently, that if you don't get young people hooked on reading a newspaper by the time they're 18, they'll never read it. I've also seen that as say if you don't get people hooked on a newspaper by the age 30, you won't be lost as readers. The theory is, has been that, well, as baby boomers, and as Generation X, these huge swells of the population uh, become the primary consumers in America, then newspapers will uh, benefit because as they age, we know that older people are better readers. And that's been the theory for years, but the data now seems to suggest that because these people haven't been connected to newspapers as John and I have been, uh, having grown up in the uh, first half of this century, part of the first half of this century, uh, the last century, and uh, in the middle part of the last century, that we were connected to newspapers in large part because they didn't have a lot of competition where it came to news and information delivery. Television wasn't much of a news force, nor was radio. There was no internet, there was no online uh, news. Uh, and so newspapers were pretty much uh, the only uh, deliverer of real news and information. And that has all changed, uh, changed with the competition. So you grew up in an era where you were comfortable with computers, where you had uh, television and lots of channels and networks to choose from to get information, not necessarily news always, but information, entertainment. And so you're much more comfortable with uh, other mechanisms of information delivery via television or via internet uh, than John and I uh, ever were, or ever will be, I suspect. I use the contrast of my 86-year-old father who reads three newspapers a day and will never be on a computer in his lifetime, versus my 16-year-old daughter who is on the computer constantly and uses it as a telephone and as a letter writing and as a <coughs> information and news sharing uh, uh, vehicle. So uh, she does read the newspaper, but not very much, not very carefully, you know, things about her school, about sports at her school, about the, her classmates. She's looking for that thing that is, you know, close to her, but she's not scouring it for news of the state, the nation, and the world. Uh, so newspapers have this old readership, have the, all these old people to read, but the sad thing is these old people are dying, and uh, they're not being replaced. So newspapers are attacking in a couple different ways. One, as I mentioned, they're evolving to more than just ink on paper products. That newspapers now use, have an online, for the most part, uh, an online uh, product where by they can deliver news and information uh, on their website. And the Star Press has that, whereas 10 years ago, the Star Press or the Star and the Press were two ink on paper products. Today, we're one ink on paper product our press, but we do have a website, we do have an online product where we deliver news and information. We do have an audio tech system whereby you can pick up the phone and get the scores of last night's game that were too late for the newspaper, or the latest news or horoscope or weather or that. We found a way to use the same information we're gathering, but find a new delivery mechanism, a new vehicle, whether it's by the telephone or by the internet. We now own a, a, a weekly newspaper uh, called the, the Advertiser, which is intended to help us compete with direct mailers uh, because we deliver that to all the people in Delaware County, all the addresses in Delaware County who don't subscribe to our paper. And so we're able to achieve uh, what is known as total market coverage, the same as the direct mailer does. And it allows us to compete with direct mailers. Uh, we print a, a monthly magazine called Prime Years which is aimed at the over 50-55 crowd uh, that has a lot of ads in there about uh, you know, 
adult diapers and eye surgery and stuff like that. Uh, because that's the, the audience for prime years. We also publish a monthly magazine you might have seen uh, in the village called JAR that's intended for a younger crowd. We're trying to find these niche audiences, trying to find different ways to do with what we do. We also publish uh, for uh, Lunsford a monthly uh, home buyer's guide. Uh, so we've become much more than just a newspaper. We've become a, new, uh, a, a publishing company that uh, takes advantage of whatever technologies might be available to deliver that news and information product that we once just delivered ink on paper. So we're, you know, we're evolving in that sense in terms of looking at how readers, how customers want to receive that information. And uh, the, the full transition of a newspaper from a paper product to an electronic product uh, will probably take another couple of generations until uh, everyone in <coughs> my age bracket is gone. Perhaps uh, uh, a lot of those people in the generation behind me. But eventually, when consumers are willing to accept the fact that they don't need the tactile uh, uh, turn-on of picking up a piece of paper, uh, or the technology allows you to have the kind of portability and electronic receiver that you get out of the paper, something that you can stick under your arm, that you can uh, out a fly with, that you can uh, cut out and put on the refrigerator. I mean, you do that with your laptop, you know, it's shot. You can, you know, the portability of this thing is going to be you're going to carry it for a while. But eventually, the the customer will be willing to accept a different technology for receiving that information. Uh, the uh, Microsoft Reader is a good example of that. Microsoft Reader. Uh, anybody read a book on one of these things? Well, there you go. Uh, Microsoft Reader allows you, I mean, it's really cool. It's a <coughs> technology. You get to load all these books in this little computer thing, man. And then you get, you know, you call it up, you turn the pages, you hit that, you, and you can read these novels. You can load them in, and you, when you're done with those, you can load in some others. And it's just really cool technology. You can take it with you. It's really small and portable. And, take, and uh, people don't like it. People are just fine with a paperback book. You can take the paperback book to the beach, and you can drop it, and you get sand in it, you know. You can bend the pages so you know where you left off, and you can stick it in your bag and not worry about dropping it. And the paperback book works just fine. It's not nearly as cool as a Microsoft Reader, but people, you know, it's a technology that addresses a problem that doesn't exist. People are perfectly fine at this point with a paperback book. Eventually, consumers will want the kind of of uh, convenience you get with a Microsoft Reader, with an e-book, and uh, they will be much more durable. They might even be pliable. They're working on a product now that has the same kind of tactile sensation that would be sort of a download computer screen where you can push a few buttons or grab the transistor on your earring and, and download a different page on there, but the receipt appliance itself will have the kind of uh, flexibility and portability that a newspaper has now. But that's going to be a few years off because the technology, frankly, is way ahead of consumer acceptance. It's way ahead of what readers right now want. And so while all that gee whiz technology is out there, readers are, a lot of readers are perfectly happy with uh, ink on paper, whether it's a newspaper or a paperback book. Eventually, that will change as the technology gets better, and as your kids and your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, does that blow your mind? Uh, as they get into an era where the receipt device is a, a contact lens on the eyeball with the uh, technology that's in the ear ring, and voice command uh, tells what to put up on the screen that you can read on your eyeball. I mean, the technology is there, it is possible. It's just we're not there yet in consumer acceptance. So newspapers are trying to evolve with the technology. In the meantime, we're trying to be more relevant, more essential to people's lives. Uh, you know, there's that argument that, well, newspapers could se still sell. The Atlanta Journal could still be in existence if it were essential to people's lives. Well, I don't believe that. I think people's lifestyles have changed so dramatically that 
a napkin newspaper just can't exist in, in, in uh, this world today, in this culture. Uh, so newspapers, you will notice, are evolving into uh, products that are more like television. USA Today was the first to do that. Uh, it was Alan Newhart's brainchild uh, that, you know, we need to create a product that does for the information consumer what television does. And how are we going to do that? Well, one of the things they did was they designed the news box. What's the news box look like? <coughs> it looks like a television set on a pedestal. It, you know, it doesn't look like your ordinary newspaper rack. It looks like a television. And what does this look like? Before USA Today came along, newspapers were black and white and a lot of text and very small photos and no graphic elements to speak of, no graphs, maps, charts, and tables. Uh, and USA Today came along and redefined it because USA Today said, we want to deliver news on paper the way television does. And that means we're going to do it in a, in a color. People are, you know, by the uh, 1970s, People had color televisions, but they had black and white newspapers. Why don't we make the, the newspaper more colorful like television? You know, we are all now, my generation, the first to sort of be the victim of television, uh, the product of television, where it was our babysitter and it was our entertainment and all. But as generations moved on, why not give them information the way they want it, which is colorful? Give them graphics so they don't have to read so much. They can look at the information and see on a chart how the economy has done this or how tuition rates have done this. And so there's a visual aspect of the colorful and the graphics. Give them a lot of headlines, a lot of short stories, because people don't read very much anymore. They, they you know, give them a page that's headline intensive and has a lot of headlines on it. Because the research shows that the three best read things on a page, on a newspaper page, one is artwork, such as this little clock up here, or that little graph down there. Those kind of things get processed more than anything in the newspaper, artwork, graphs, maps, charts, tables, and drawings. Second most read thing are photographs, so give them lots of photographs. And the <coughs> third best read thing are headlines, so give them lots of headlines. What's the least read thing in a newspaper? What? The articles themselves, the text in the articles, about 24% of it gets processed. More than 80% of the artwork gets processed, gets looked at, about 24% of the text. And so find a way through pictures and cut lines, the captions with the pictures, and graphics, and headlines, and subheadlines, and uh, all kinds of other visual doodads. Find a way to give them the information without making them read the damn story. And that's the way newspapers go together. So you see, you know, this is looking more and more, newspapers are looking more and more like those tabloid products. Tabloid products go a lot for visual appeal because they need to sell you right there at the newsstand. And so you don't see a lot of text above the fold in this newspaper. When you see it in the box, when you see it lying down at the village pantry, wherever you might pick it up, you see lots of headlines, you see lots of graphic elements, you see lots of art, you see lots of things that are going to stimulate you to think about buying this newspaper. And the difference is the bottom of the page has very little art, frankly, lots of text, but that's where it is. But they make the sale up here, and then they give you some of the information down. I mean, you just see it, but it's a visual product. So newspapers are moving toward the way you, the way the consumer, wants information. We just changed our weekend, to cover our weekend page, our weekend section on Fridays, to make a page that looks a lot like that. Because the latest research shows that, especially in that area of music and entertainment, you don't want a lot of depth. What you want to know is what the hell is going on. You want graphics, you want images, you want art, colorful stuff, but you don't want to read a whole lot. You want to know who's in concert, where it is, and what time it starts, and and what the ticket price is, and how you get the tickets, and how you get there, and where you park. You know, you just want that essential information. You don't want to know a whole lot about it, because you're receiving other kind of information somewhere else. But from a newspaper, yeah, you want short reads, but you want it to be 
visually interesting. And so newspapers are moving toward that. Less text, more visual stimulation for the reader. A lot like television. So newspapers are evolving to try to interest younger readers into reading newspapers. But there's a lot of information in there. And we find that you still do pick up the newspaper from time to time. Maybe not ours, but at least the daily news. And uh, you are interested in things that go on in the world, generally. Uh, you do want information. Uh, you're not going to dwell on a lot, but you do want information. So how do newspapers tap in? How do newspapers get you to read them? How, what do they do? And so the research tends to indicate, that even though we've got a lot of old readers, quite frankly, the researcher told us, you know those old readers you got? You can poke them in the eye, and they'll still read your newspaper. Now, you got to be careful. You don't poke them in two eyes, and they can't read at all, or there's nothing there for them. But frankly, they'll accept change. They will read your newspaper till the day they die because they've read your newspaper for 30 and 40 and 50 years. And they're not going to give up the, 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 news, the newspaper reading habit just because you happen to drop Dennis the Menace. They'll call you, they'll raise hell with you, and say, Oh, my God, your newspaper's gone to hell. You don't have Dennis the Menace anymore. That was the only thing I read in your newspaper. We know they're lying, because they also read the obit just to find out where they need to get out of bed in the morning. But they, they, you know, they, you know, they'll pay it. But, you know, they'll read you. You can poke them in the eye, and they'll still read your newspaper. But your future isn't in those 50 and 60 and 70 and 80-year-old books. Even the fastest-growing population uh, bracket as people over 80, thanks to medical science. Uh, but, in fact, this Generation Y, this Generation X readers, we need to get them, before the, certainly before they're 30, into the newspaper reading habit, so we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. I suspect what you're going to see in the next uh, five to ten years is lots of newspapers going to do what the Daily News does, which is make itself available to you at no cost. Even though we gather about 20% of our income from selling the newspaper to you, 20% of our revenue roughly comes from selling the newspaper, about 80% from advertising. Uh, it's going to get to the point where we'll be giving it to you. Because we need to hold those advertisers. In fact, advertisers don't care whether you pay for the newspaper or not. Advertisers care only that you had the newspaper in your hand, you saw the ad, you responded to it, you clicked out the coupon, you went to the store to get the deal, whatever it was. Because everybody doesn't care whether you subscribe or whether you went to McDonald's and picked it up off the table to read it and hey, saw that ad. They just want to make sure we get that in your hand. And so the trend is moving toward a free circulation newspaper. Uh, and every newspaper will be like that. I suspect that's where we're headed. Well, that pretty much expired my lecture notes on uh, where newspapers are headed. Uh, you got questions? You got comments? You got concerns? Yeah. Um, I heard you said that a lot of You're not concerned about that local smoking ban? You're not concerned about that highway bypass? Might be built yeah, around but not like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean, exactly. And in fact, the readers like you and readers like people who don't subscribe to our newspaper, the interest has, has been obvious since September 11th. Uh, I had sort of a discussion with some of the people in our newspaper the other day because uh, we virtually, uh, except for uh, one story on page one and maybe one story inside, we had nothing in there regarding the follow-up on the war and the anthrax uh, scare and all that stuff. But we had a uh, wire editor put together this full health page inside. And I said, you know, we can't do that. We've got to get that breaking news in there because ever since September 11th, our single copy sales, sales to non-subscribers, those that drop the 50 cents in the box or go to the village camp and pick it up, our sales have been up. And they haven't been up hoping to see a health page in our newspaper. They've been up specifically because the events of September 11th have created an additional interest in the news, and not about the local smoking ban, and not about the bypass that they might complete around Muncie. It had everything to do with the, uh, our response, the war, the anthrax issue, uh, 
people have been tuning into television more and newspaper sales are up too. And so, uh, yeah, I think what that shows is that, and that what we hope it shows, is that people still do want information and things that really interest them. And if newspapers can deliver it, newspapers can provide that detail, that people will buy newspapers. And so it is our challenge to make the newspaper that vital, that essential to people every day, to provide them with information that they might not get anywhere else. So, yeah, that's a good point. Since September 11th, it's really made a difference. Yeah. Do you ever see um, maybe different papers going to, say, all online I mean, product and I stop distributing the paper altogether? Um, I don't know whether you've seen the Microsoft Reader ads, but uh, they, they've shown up in some trade publication like Real Content. We just died. Did you see that, John? Mm -hmm. uh, where the ad says that in the year 2016 will be the last year that a metropolitan newspaper publishes a print edition. That they peg that date, they wishfully peg that date, that by then people will be getting all of their information, at least in the large areas, uh, large population areas, will be getting all of their information through some electronic receipt system. Uh, that transition is happening now. Uh, for example, we see that during the winter, uh, all the, what they call the snowbirds, retirees who live around here in the winter, and head south in the, in the for the winter, I mean, they live around here year-round and go south to Arizona, Florida. But we used to sell a lot of mail subscriptions. So those are way down. And that is because now these people have their own computers, or they go to the public library down there, and they log on to the Star Press online, and they read the obituaries. And basically, a little, little bit more, but they read the obituaries. And so they get what information they need online. And eventually, you know, as the consumer can accept that, is ready for that, ready for that technology, it will happen. I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. I don't think it'll happen in your lifetime, frankly. But your children, your grandchildren might see that day where the technology is such <laughs> that it has a lot of the qualities, the portability, and the dependability, uh, the reliability of uh, ink on paper product. And at that point, and where it's cost effective for to, to be done that way, uh, it will happen. Publishers would love to make it happen because more than half of their costs are involved in production. Buying paper, ink, delivery, uh, that's, a, that's a hell of a big expense. And if we can deliver news and information electronically, we really improve our bottom line because we <coughs> cut out more than half of our expense. Yeah, you're good. Boy, I'm a good. Uh, that has changed over the years in large part because of the inserts. Uh, in the old days, the old days, uh, back in the, uh, back when the newspapers were newspapers, uh, before the, the advertisers saw the advantages of just using us as a distribution system through inserts, you know, those things that they drop on the floor and pick up the daily news and shake out and stuff. Uh, in the days before the inserts, when all of it was run of press advertising, ROP, the ideal percentage was 40% news, 60% advertising. But since it has, uh, we've moved toward a lot of pre-print advertising, the ratio has turned around. That most newspapers, our newspaper, is about 60% news and 40% advertising on the pages. But a lot of that advertising that had been on the pages has been moved into pre-print, insert advertising. Larry, in terms of uh, women and minorities, especially blacks, uh, are blacks going into the business and are women doing the same? What are the demographics today? Uh, there's been a concerted effort by uh, uh, most uh, newspaper companies uh, and Gannett, of which, which publishes USA Today, as well as the Star Press, uh, has had an initiative for years to try to increase the number of minorities in the newsroom. And in fact, we have, I get a, I get a report every week that lists on there 
for our market area, the percentage of females in our market area and the percentage of uh, minorities in our area, and then next to it is the percentage of our workforce that are female and the percentage of our workforce that are minority. And the idea is that newspapers want to recruit, want to encourage more women, more minorities, so that they're in the newsroom and represent the interests of those special interests, frankly. Uh, because as much as, as much as I think I can understand what is important to women, what I think I can understand to an extent what is important to uh, minorities, Hispanics, African Americans, Asian Americans, I can't really appreciate it as they can. And so newspapers, if the content is going to reflect the interest of Asian Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and women, has to have a staff that looks like our customers. That is, because we have 10% or so in Muncie uh, of the population that's African American, maybe we ought to have 10% of our staff. If you look at our overall market area, which brings in a lot of areas that don't have a very large population of African-American, uh, uh, I think our market population is somewhere around 4%. So we need to make sure that at least 4% of our, of our uh, staff is African-American. 52% uh, is women. we got to make sure that 52% of our staff are women so that we can accurately reflect the interest of our readers. Because if we got a bunch of old white men sitting around trying to figure out what interests these people, what interest is people who are under 30? I mean, my God, you know, we got to get younger people in the newsroom too, but that's not an area that we've, there's really an initiative on, but there, there certainly needs to be. We're trying to find ways to get younger people at least to provide some uh, input into uh, content so that we can, we can appeal to younger readers as well. But, uh, yeah, it's one of those areas that newspapers are extremely interested in because uh, we need to make sure that our staff, we need to make sure our content reflects who our readers are and what they're interested in. But it's, the newsroom business especially is, is difficult for, for women because uh, in our society women still, even if they have a job, still end up taking care of the house. I mean, I don't hate to tell you guys this, you think you got to go on an equal basis with a man, but you know, society hasn't changed that much either. That you know, man works, woman works, go home, who does the laundry? Well, I got bad news for you. Uh, same person's going to do most of the cooking and most of the cleaning, and so that's where you need uh, Mary Mae to do the cleaning, and you need to make sure that he's responsible for a couple of meals a week, and that uh, by golly, he can do part of his own laundry, and you know, insist on that stuff. Don't let him get away with it. But the fact is that a woman still has, and so. Because newspapers are largely morning newspapers, and that means we work in the afternoon and evening, and the women also have the large responsibility, large part of the responsibility for child rearing as well. And so, you know, what does a man do? You know, let's not let him get away with this anymore, okay? I mean, commit yourself, you know, get a contract, you know, when you get married and say, you're doing your own damn underwear, pal. I'm not going to you, okay? Draw the line, so. Yeah, you know, Larry became a feminist, I think, when his daughter was born. <laughs> what? Uh, Larry, the, the, the paper is actually published in Indianapolis. Is, is that going to be a continuing trend, say, for all the papers, like the Marion paper? Synergy! We've achieved synergy! <laughs> and our newspaper's an hour later! Uh, We've achieved synergy because uh, we have uh, Indianapolis Press running the Indianapolis paper and the Muncie paper. Eventually, they'll probably also publish the Marion paper and the Lafayette paper. Because if you can have one press room doing that, it beats having five press rooms do that. That you're able to cut your overhead, you're able to uh, indeed uh, eliminate uh, a lot of your expense involved in production if you're able to consolidate various functions. And so I suspect Gannett will continue to consolidate a number of functions. Eventually, all the business and accounting stuff will be taken care of in Indianapolis. All the HR stuff, human resources, personnel, benefits will take care of in Indianapolis. And that Muncie will, will become something of a satellite of a larger operation. Uh, to what extent, I don't know, but you know, it's moving that direction. For Synergy!
like like the various television channels. Okay, before before we go, we all know that we stay in just ten minutes. Ago. What can you tell Mr. Law as an LAW that you have learned that would help him be a better editor of the monthly paper? What would you tell him? Five points. What would make you buy the newspaper three times a week? What could what, what we do with it to make you buy it three times a week? Or more? Buy? Or subscribe to it? You're broke. Okay, give you a job. We can start with that. <laughs> Just the expense? Yeah. Half price. You've all seen it? Half price will give it to you. Buck sixty a week. Okay, so, so, I got a card right here. So, so that's point one. Point number two, what are you going to tell Mr. Law in terms of what can he learn today? Yeah. I put cartoons on the front page. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I put cartoons throughout. We put Jim's on the front page, we put Dilbert on the business page, we put... We haven't put them on the front page yet, but... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got pluggers on page two, you can have them on page two, but Jim Davis said he'd rather have them on the, uh, the comic page. Okay, point three. Who's going to give us point three? What would you suggest to Mr. Law about the the editing of the paper? Okay, so you're saying give you the paper. That could make you read it. Yeah. If we gave it to you, you might. If we gave you every day, you might read it three days a week. Okay. I, I okay, what kind of law? You want a free, you want cartoons, you want, you want some entertainment value to it. Well, how, about, how about an idea? Right here. Headline oh, yeah. your, like your main stories is like a direct attack on being like when some kind of What it's going to do to you? Yeah. How and, and if people want that news close to home, you know, I want news about me and my family. If I can fill a newspaper with, I really read it every day. Yeah. Would too. That's my best journey. Exactly. <laughs> okay, guys, with the pause in yeah. the back here. Point number four. Point number four. We got thirty seconds. We might be up to five. What did you learn? Come on. What well, do you want in the newspaper every day? You want more sports? Yeah. Sports yeah. on the front page? Yeah. 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 Sports? Yeah, but, but at least get, get that presence out there. Yeah. yeah. Make it more variety, more well, on the cover. I think comparison to sports, like how Purdue and Jamal say, you know. I you maybe. I you won this week. Okay. You're losers. <laughs> You're terrible. Okay, I see you. Thank you very much for the awesome.